Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, just to say, I obviously can't talk about actual cases because all my cases are people who actually work in this trust. So I'm going to just be talking about uh, the issues in general. Uh, so let's just, and really I've called this talk when surgeons become patients. I do see plenty of surgeons in my department um, and, and this is really all about your health and well-being and it's something us as doctors just don't think about enough. So I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about occupational health and just to remind you what it is. Occupational health is a medical specialty which is all about how your health affects your work and how your work affects your health. We come under the Faculty of Occupational Medicine, which is part of the Royal College of Physicians, and it's a four-year higher medical specialist training. And it's very interesting because you can train outside the NHS in industry and in the armed forces as well. I think one of the challenges is occupational medicine isn't taught well enough or hardly at all at medical school. And I just want to ask you, could you put up your hand if you've learned any occupational medicine at all in your training? Wow, that's not one single person. Okay, then you're not going to know who this person is. So I'm going to introduce you to this. This is Bernardino Ramazzini, the father of occupational medicine. He was born in 1633 and he became professor of medicine at the University of Padua. And he became very interested in diseases of occupations. And he wrote a fantastic book, which makes great bedtime reading if you're good at Latin. Here it is, De Morbis Artificum Diatriba. And he described diseases of occupations, particularly particularly when people were in contact with chemicals and dusts um, and uh, repetitive movements and so on. And he was absolutely spot on. As I said, this was published in 1700. One of my favorite descriptions is, is that of the sedentary worker. Now, I know you surgeons are mainly not sedentary workers, but just imagine some of your physician colleagues, we are, and just see if this description describes anybody you know. All sedentary workers suffer from the itch, are a bad color and in poor condition. For when the body is not kept moving, the blood becomes tainted. Its waste matter lodges in the skin and the condition of the whole body deteriorates. And I think he was pretty much spot on there. Um, just to say, oops, something just a little bit about the principles of how we work in occupational health. We take confidentiality incredibly seriously, and our note system is completely separate to the notes in the rest of the trust, and that's something that's very important that people need to understand. Having said that, every time I see somebody, I will say to them, if I'm really worried about your health and well-being or the well-being of patients in your care, I will have to do something about it. But other than that, this is going to be confidential. We're independent. We're there to support the employee, but also to give advice to the manager, the organization, and the individual. Hopefully there's no stigma at all coming to see us because everybody comes to see us at some point in their careers and there is easy access to see us and that's important because we're here on site. Um, the other important thing, no matter where this is, is that we're very much in the middle of things so we can really um, orchestrate and sort problems out. So we're obviously in, in liaison with the employee and the employer. With consent, we can liaise with somebody's GP or their treating consultant. And we may well have written letters to you over the years and asked you for reports. And if we have done, thank, thank you very much for applying. And then with trainees, we can also liaise with the deanery. And that means that we can really sort out complex problems and issues. This is where we are, if you haven't come to see us. We are the Centre for Occupational Health and Wellbeing here on the John Radcliffe site. We've got a small department as well at the Horton, and this department was actually opened by Sir Roger Bannister a couple of years ago. We were very proud that he came to open the department. Um, we... Um, I have a whole team there to help support staff in the trust. We've got three consultants, a whole team of occupational health advisors. Those are what we call our nurses. Um, we have two physiotherapists who are there to support staff with work-related musculoskeletal problems. We've got a health and well-being specialist who's doing a lot of work in the trust trying to improve health and well-being, things like looking at what food is available on call and what food is being sold around, looking at sort of work to support mental health in the trust as well. So um, I have been involved and interested in doctors' health and well-being for around the last 10 years, and this has become a subspecialty of occupational medicine. 
Um, we have, um, as Freddie kindly said at the beginning, in the Faculty of Occupational Medicine, we have got a training program now to train occupational health physicians in um, physicians' health and well-being. Um, there is a UK association, a European association of physicians' health, and an international association. And I've been involved over the years in all those organisations. And I've also become the... Um, Occupational Health Physician for Oxford Deanery for Health Education Thames Valley. And we see about 40 or 50 referrals a year um, from the deanery regarding um, trainees with, with challenges of different sorts, trainees in need of support. So I'm just going to mention physical health. It's not the main thing I want to talk about today, but we certainly do see lots of people with physical health problems. The sorts of things we might see in surgeons that are very relevant are hand dermatitis. Of course, that's hugely important if you've got hand dermatitis. Not surprising. You use disinfectant, you wear gloves, you do lots of hand washing. That's a big, big problem if you're a surgeon. I see plenty of surgeons with musculoskeletal problems. Um, people who manual, you know, doctors, we all manual handle patients. Many of us don't do proper manual handling training. Again, I'm going to ask you, who has done actual hands-on manual handling training in the last few years. Well, good. That's probably about half the people in the room. That's excellent. Because I see plenty of doctors who have back injuries from manual handling, and people need to take that seriously. Um, I see people, doctors who look down microscopes a lot with neck problems. I see people who do a lot of ultrasound work with wrist problems, what we call work-related upper limb disorders. And all of those are things that we can help sort out. Um, we actually go into the workplace. We can bring our physios. We can do ergonomic assessments. There's all sorts of things things we can help you with. But that's not the main thing I want to talk about today. The main thing I actually want to talk about is psychological health and well-being in doctors. And sadly, whether we like it or not, you know, medicine is an amazing profession, but we have a significantly higher incidence of anxiety and depression compared with the rest of the population. And we also have a significantly higher incidence of drug and alcohol abuse. The um, the MA did a study uh, a few years ago that suggested that one in 15 of us have a significant alcohol or drug problem, and that's probably two people, equivalent to two people actually in this room, so that's, that's pretty serious. Unfortunately, if we look at who particularly has uh, drug problems, it's your colleagues at the other end of the table, anaesthetists are the people with the higher, highest incidence of drug problems within the medical profession. It's been a stable incidence over the last sort of 20 to 30 years of, of 1 to 1.6 percent, mainly male anaesthetists, interestingly mainly younger anaesthetists, abusing nar narcotics, abusing IV drugs, often abusing more than one drug at a time, and the drug of anaesthetic choice is, is fentanyl, sadly. The good news is, is if you can get a doctor to an addiction specialist and get them a proper treatment program, they have extremely good prognosis. Um, more worrying for all of us is the very significant uh, increased relative risk of suicide in the medical profession. Um, I mean, that people talk about sort of a minimum of two to three times increased incidence compared to the general population. And this is just a paper talking about the relative risk compared to other healthcare professionals or other professionals. Uh, females, 3.7 to 4.5, and males, 1.5 to 3.8. And in America, they are saying there is 300 to 400 physician suicides a year. 300 to 400 a year. Just imagine, that's pretty much the size of a small medical school. I mean, it's, it's absolutely shocking, and we, you know, we have to be dealing with this. One of the reasons I'm, I'm talking to you here today. Also, doctors are very good at, at, at actually successful suicide compared to the rest of the population. They, they kind of know a lot. We know a lot about how to, how to do this. We have access and knowledge about drugs. And the, the specialties that have a particularly high rate of suicide are GP, GPs, uh, psychiatrists, and, and, and anaesthetists as well. The only, the only bit of good news I can tell you is we're not quite as bad as the vets. Uh, the vets actually are, are the worst profession, and that's because not only do they have access to animal drugs, they have access to guns as well, because you, you know, if you're a vet working with big animals, you, you, shoot, a, you shoot an animal if, if it needs to be put down. But you know, that's a, a very sobering thought as well. I mean, the issue is, if you have suicidal ideation, you actually have a means to do something about it. It's, it's a really serious, really, really serious issue. So what about suicidal ideation in surgeons? Well, there was one very good study that was done and published in 2010 
where they sent a survey to all the surgeons in the American College of Surgeons. That's about 25,000 surgeons. And they had about a 32% response rate. And 6.3% of those surgeons had had, i.e. 501 people, had actually experienced suicidal ideation in the last 12 months. Significantly higher than the general population. And not surprisingly, the people with suicidal ideation also had symptoms of burnout and of depression as well. But I think the most important statistic in that paper is this that only 26% of those surgeons actually sought help or felt able to seek help or, or, or were prepared or able to find somewhere to go. And I think that's the, that's the vital statistic here. So um, what are the barriers to us doctors seeking help in this situation? Well, I think the first barrier that we all need to think about and get over actually is stigma. Um, you know, one in four of us is probably going to have some sort of mental health issue at some point in our lives. As far as I'm concerned, it should be treated exactly the same as any physical health issue. And if we can't get over this as a profession to help look after ourselves, we won't be able to help look after patients with these issues in our care as well. This is hugely, hugely important. We are very busy people, aren't we? We're very busy. We, we have a, a high workload. We haven't got time to go and, and look after ourselves, you know, but actually we've got to, I think we've got to rethink that. Access to services, it's not easy to find service that people feel comfortable with, and that's, that's hugely important. The one place where there is a good service for doctors is in London. There's something called the Practitioner Health Programme that was set up by Claire Gerarda, and the, she's managed to get funding to look after any physician in London who lives within the M25 can self-refer to the Practitioner Health Programme and gets a good psychological support and care and secondary um, psychological health care as well. Um, and unfortunately, the plan was that there would be programmes like this all around the country, but then there was no money to follow it forward. I mean, talk about postcode lottery for healthcare, but that's Outside of London, places like um, you know, Oxford, I mean, we, we do see, I'm going to tell you in a minute how many doctors we see here and, and what, we, what we've done to help support doctors around, but it, it's patchy. There's no, no getting away from the fact that it's patchy. People hugely worry about if they disclose a problem like this to occupational health, what happens to their future job prospects. And I want to reassure you that as far as we're concerned, so long as you've had a physical or a mental health problem and you are now better or you've supported or you're getting the right care and treatment, that's all I'm interested in when I'm looking at work health assessment, whether somebody's fit for work. Uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that you're well, and, you're well and better, and that's important. Obviously, there's this medical culture of self-reliance and coping, and it doesn't happen to us. And again, we're going to talk about that a bit more in a minute. And then people worry hugely about the G GMC involvement. And let me, I want to reassure you that the GMC is now very clear that so long as somebody is getting the right help and treatment, they're not treating themselves, they're taking advice from an appropriate person, appropriate specialist, they don't want to know about the problem. And that's true for things like addiction as well. Uh, I've seen, honestly, probably six, seven hundred doctors over the last few years. I haven't referred a single person to the GMC. I often see people the other way around. The GMC asks me to see people. But so far, so good. I haven't referred anybody. The other thing is that, uh, you know, Freddie, you mentioned denial. You know, this is a fantastic book, When Doctors Become Patients, by a doctor called Robert Klitzman. Uh, Robert Klitzman is a psychiatrist in New York who very sadly lost his sister in 9-11 and became profoundly depressed. He couldn't believe that he as a psychiatrist had become depressed. That's this really challenge that I have seen people when moving over from being the person that's doing the treating to the dark side, being the patient. And that's some, one of the journeys that I have to help people to, to make. It's very hard. We don't like being patients. You know, we're the ones doing the treating. And as part of his uh, recovery, he decided to research other doctors and their journeys of, of, of how they recover from different illnesses, and he wrote this wonderful book called When Doctors Become Patients. And this is the perfect quote. It's a quote from a, a middle-aged oncologist with metastatic cancer. And I know we don't wear white coats anymore, but you, you'll get the picture. He said, we doctors wear magic white coats. We destroy disease all the time. How could it ever attack us? You know, this is how we, this is how we all feel, don't we? You know, we, we, you know it's, it's not for us, is it? And then when we become unwell, we, of course, don't behave like normal patients, do we? Many of us don't have a GP, and one of the things I talk to when I talk at doctor's induction, I talk to everybody about the importance of getting a GP when you're well, when you don't need one. If you're acutely unwell, it's very hard finding a GP. Hugely important having a GP. And then if you have got a GP using a GP, um, 
We're very good at self-diagnosis, aren't we? You know, if you have a bad headache one day and it goes on and on, you know, the, the real the obvious reason is we just haven't drunk enough at work because we've all been so busy. But, you know, I'm sure we all kind of, our minds start thinking about, you know, different, horrible differential diagnosis of headaches. And lots of you are smiling, so I know that you're, you're with me on that one. Um, Self-prescribing. Um, we shouldn't be self-prescribing at all. This is something the GMC is now very clear about. We shouldn't be self-prescribing for ourselves or prescribing for our families or prescribing for friends. If you do end up doing something like that in emergency, you have to tell your GP or that individual's GP. And the GMC is actually getting very strict about this now. And I've got a friend who does GP appraisals, and one of the things that she says at appraisal is not um, actually, you know, have you ever self-prescribed, but when did you last self-prescribe, you know, as the, as the appropriate question. You know, we have to we have to move on from that. And actually, corridor consultations. I've actually just seen a corridor consultation in, in progress, <laughs> dare I say. Um, this does often happen, and we, we, all, we all do it. Uh, you know, what, what happens is you wake up in, with a horrible rash on your arm one morning. You're just sort of walking along, and here you see a fantastic dermatology registrar, and you say, oh, listen, just have a look at my arm. What do you think's going on here? What do you think's happened? And we often, not always, but we often, you don't get the best care uh, in a corridor consultation. You know, you, you know, that's not always the best way of doing things. So um, just, just, a, just a moment of caution there. The other interesting thing with doctors is who manages us. Who is the manager? It's very tricky, isn't it? And most other people in this organization, it's very clear who the manager is. For a junior doctor, is the manager the clinical supervisor, the educational supervisor who may be in a different trust, the unit manager who may be sort of non-medical. Uh, you know, there's a whole host, a whole host of people, and they often fall between between all those different stools. You know, who is monitoring their sickness absence? Do we know when people are here and when they're not here? And I think um, with first care now, the sickness absence uh, monitoring um, system in the trust, I'm told that that is getting better. We also, therefore, don't get timely referrals of doctors the way we often should do. We don't get appropriate referrals. And many doctors who are managers uh, find it very hard to manage and not treat. So let me give you an example. Um, you know, it's quite common. I get a phone call. Somebody phones me up, a consultant, and says, listen, Evie, I'm worried about my junior doctor. They've told me they've got depression. They were taking citalopram. They were having quite a lot of side effects. So I was saying to them, why don't you take venlafaxine? And I was thinking of talking to their GP. And I say, listen, just stop there. You are not treating this person, you are managing them, you know, back off from the medical side of this, please refer them to me, we'll look at all of that side of things. But we, we find it quite hard to take our medical hats off, don't we? That's, that's important. So it's just important to think about the impact of our health. If, if our health is less good, how does that actually impact work? And the first concept I just want to talk to you about is the concept of presenteeism. Now, can anyone tell me, has anyone heard of presenteeism? Do you know what it is? Somebody's nodding there. What's presenteeism? Uh, yeah, absolutely. The concept of presenteeism is being there when you're not actually well enough to be there. It's the, it's the opposite of absenteeism. Doctors are very good at this. You know, we say, you know, we, we can't possibly go, we can't go off sick. But actually, if you're here and you're not well enough to be here, you can truly compromise patient care. You can expose colleagues and patients to harm. And if you come back too soon, say after an operation, you actually end up with a, with a, with a slower recovery potentially as well. Um, the other, um, there's been quite a lot of studies looking at the effect of doctors' health on performance. NCAS, hopefully none of you have had anything to do with NCAS. NCAS is the National Clinical Assessment Service. It's a national service that doctors are referred to if they have performance and behavior difficulties that can't be sorted out in their, in their local trusts. And the first thing they do when they're referred to NCAS is they have a very full occupational health assessment. And the studies have shown that 25% of those people with behavioral and performance problems actually have a significant health problem as well um, that, that, that nobody sort of realized or thought about. So that's hugely important. Also with junior doctors, when, you, when you're looking at junior doctors and you're worrying about junior doctors' performance, you know, is, there, is there a background health issue we need to be thinking about here? There's lots of studies from around the world as well. I mean, this is not a local problem or a national problem. This whole issue is, is international, this issue of doctor's health. Um, one particular study in the States was looking at depressed junior doctors and showing they made six times the errors in prescribing medication compared to non-depressed uh, non cohorts. So, you know, very important. And, and this slide is actually a whole, a whole talk on its own, so I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about it. But this is sort of putting this all together. The impact of work on health now, that's the, the flip side of that. Well, there's sort of six areas of workplace design that if they're not well controlled can affect us in the workplace. 
demands, of course, you know, what's coming through the door. The trouble with healthcare is, you know, we can't stop the demands coming through the door. Control, how much control do we have over what we actually do day to day and, and, and how we work? Probably hugely important support. Have we got the support from our colleagues and our managers that we really need to help us to perform? Have we got clarity of role? You know, do we really know what we're doing? Are we doing what our job plans actually say? Are there any relationship issues in the workplace? And how is change managed? Change is always going to happen, but sometimes, you know, change can sometimes be managed better than other times. And of course, the culture of the organization is hugely important in all this as well. Then that all impacts on us all as employees. We can get individual symptoms, you know, tummy upsets, pain, and so on, um, leading to you know, psychological and physical health outcomes. Um, of course, there are organizational symptoms as well, um, redu reduced staff performance, reduced staff morale, and so on. And the bottom line is, you know, you can have increased accidents, increased lit um, lit lit uh, Litigation is the word I'm looking for, and, and, and so on. So, you know, we've got to think very carefully about how work impacts on all of us, because it adversely, if you get it wrong, can adversely impact on us as individuals and adversely impact upon the whole organisation as well. And this is a very famous graph about work-related stress. People ban the word stress about a lot. Stress isn't necessarily a bad thing. Stress is actually quite a good thing in, in the right quantities. Uh, this is performance against the level of pressure. Actually, if you don't have any, anything much to do and, you, and, you know, and, and you're bored, um, actually you don't perform very well. You then kind of, as pressure increases, get into your comfort zone. But actually, we all perform best in this stretch area here. It's good, it's good to be a bit stretched, isn't it? The problem is when you go into strain and into crisis going down the other end, and that's, that's much less good. So early warning signs, you all know these, but do you actually pick them up? Obviously, increase minor physical problems, coughs, colds, backaches, headaches, tummy upsets, those sorts of things. Uh, relationship problems, being irritable, both at work and at home. And I don't know you, but I've occasionally, you know, held it in all the way through the day. You get in and five minutes within getting, getting home, you lash out at somebody. I, I suspect we've all done it and, and been ashamed of doing it at, at some time or the other. Having negative thoughts. I mean, when we get very stressed, we actually stop thinking straight and our thoughts can become very, very negative. And, um, you know, it was, it, and, and examples of that are we can have very black and white thinking, and there's something called catastrophizing, which we all have a habit of doing as well. When something goes wrong, you know, let's say you make a mistake at work, within 30 seconds in, in our brain, you can have decided that you've lost your job, you can't pay your mortgage, and you're living in a cardboard box on the road. And again, we, we, we all do this, and, and learning to challenge those negative thoughts, you know, and as you get more stressed, those thoughts sort of become more common. Um, Increased unhealthy behavior, so it's easy to go home and pour that glass of wine, and then how big is your, you know, when people say they have a glass of wine, you know, you know my glass of wine and your glass of wine may be very different sized glasses. You know, it's so easy to do that and get into the habit of doing that. And then not having time to do the, the healthy bits that we know are important as well, like exercising. And then at the end of the day, things get worse and worse. Uh, we can have symptoms of really physical exhaustion and lack of emotional energy. And this is actually a cartoon from a, a, a GP magazine. Uh, it's the GP talking to, to the GP's patient. It's the GP talking here. And that's sometimes how, we <laughs> how, how we'd all like to be having our, our consultations. So the end of this is something called burnout. And burnout was described by Maslach in the 1990s. And it's a syndrome, work-related syndrome, of chronic overstress that happens in the caring professions. It happens in nurses, in teachers, in social workers, and certainly in the medical profession. And there's three main elements to burnout. There's emotional exhaustion. You just haven't got the emotional energy for your patients anymore. You just you know, you can't face giving and giving and giving. The concept of depersonalization, when again, they're not, they're not real people anymore. It may be the gallbladder in bed four, not Mrs. Smith with cholecystitis or whatever in bed four. And this real sense of decreased personal accomplishment. So you end up with really physical, psychological, and cognitive exhaustion and having no satisfaction in, in practicing medicine anymore. And I certainly do see people who are burnt out and it often can take me three months to get them sorted of, of not being in work. You know, they, they need real time to, to recover and recuperate. <clears throat> 
So is there any work on, on burnout in surgeons? Well, well, yes, there is. Going back to that study of the 26,000 surgeons that was done in America, they, they looked at this side of things as well. And uh, remember, um, we, we had, this was, uh, they actually had a response rate of about 32%, so this was between seven and 8,000 surgeons that responded. On average, they'd been in practice for 18 years, they were on average working 60-hour week, and they were on call two nights a week. And they all filled in questionnaires for burnout and depression, and 40% of them had symptoms that were indicative of burnout, and 30% had symptoms of depression. Uh, I mean, there, there are some people who don't believe that burnout actually um, exists. Um, it is defined under ICD-10, but not under DSM-5, and some people think there is a, a sort of big overlap with depression, but, you know, I, I, it doesn't matter what we call it, really. Interestingly, though, some independent associated factors uh, in their working environment and in their personal environment for, for developing um, burnout. They were younger in general, the doctors, the surgeons that developed burnout. They had children, particularly younger children, and I suspect this may be due to how much sleep you get. You know, if you're not sleeping when you're on call at work, and maybe you're not sleeping at home as well, and you know, if you're getting up with your, your little kids, that could be very relevant. Interesting, the area of specialization, so the highest risk was in trauma, urology, general surgery, vascular surgery, and NEMT. Don't know exactly why that is. Trauma, you could possibly think about why, but the, other, the others I don't know. <clears throat> Not surprisingly related to how many nights you work on call a week, how many hours you work a week, and this is very American, how they got compensation, that compensation was based only on billing. Um, and only 30... 6% of them thought they actually had enough time for their personal and family life. And again, I think the most important thing was that burnout was the single greatest predictor of satisfaction with their career and with the speciality that they were working in. So that's, that's hugely important, isn't it? <clears throat> um, there's also... Uh, again, thinking about your, your colleagues at the other end of the table, there's a big study last year, I don't know if you've heard about it, a morale and welfare study of anaesthetic trainees. Uh, I'm, I'm told there's about 7,000 plus trainees in the country, and they sent this questionnaire to everybody, and they had 2,300 trainees respond, which isn't, isn't a bad response rate. And they said that 64% of them had their physical health affected by work, 61% had their mental health, thought their mental health had been affected by work, and 85% were potentially at risk of burnout. Now, you can say this is a self-selecting group. You can say maybe the other two-thirds were feeling absolutely fantastic, but it's still a significant number, and it's, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to think about it. And, and the key issues that those anaesthetists, anaesthetic trainees were talking about were hours, they were worried about patient safety, shift work and, and long commute. And certainly I see, I, you know, the, probably the most extreme case of junior doctors and hours and difficulty I saw was I had a, two junior doctors who, who were a couple and, and they couldn't work out a time to get married because they just couldn't get their, 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 their rotors overlapping. I mean, it was, it was crazy. They, they just couldn't, couldn't organize it. It was completely crazy. So, you know, stresses in doctors, um, there, there are lots of these, um, and it, you know, we, haven't, we haven't got time to talk about this in huge detail today. I mean, many, many stresses that we deal with at, at work. Obviously, um, dealing with sick patients, uh, fear of litigation, um, bloodborne viruses, um, you know, um, violence from patients, sadly, bullying, harassment, and so on. Uh, factors from home that we all have, you know, balancing our work-life balance. Um, people are sort of my sort of age, we're, we're, we're called the sandwich generation, we're looking after kids and we're looking after sick parents as well, so you've got to manage that too. Um, relationship issues at home and at work, the medical culture that, you know, we don't get sick, it doesn't happen to us. All those biological factors, you know, we're not sleeping enough, we're probably not eating well enough, and so on. And then this really interesting issue of the medical personality. Now, most of us, most of us are self-critical perfectionists. I mean, I know I'm happy to put my hand up and say, yes, I am a self-critical perfectionist. It is the commonest personality trait in doctors. And, uh, you know, in one hand, doctors need to be obsessional and self-critical to avoid mishaps, you might, you might say. And if you're a patient, it's probably very good that you have an obsessional and, and self-critical doctor who's checking and making sure that everything's going okay. But actually, uh, that type of personality is associated with higher rates of depression because we, you're beating yourself up the whole time. It's, it's, it's not a good thing. 
And there's also this other challenge that we have, a sort of challenge of the, the double bind. And the double bind is defined as an emotionally distressing dilemma when we receive two conflicting messages when one negates the other. So I think we'll agree with this. Here's an example. To be a good doctor, one needs to be able to relate to patients and be capable of empathy and humanity. Do we all agree with that? I'm sure we all agree with that. And here's an example of an empathetic doctor. <laughs> However, to survive emotionally, one needs to be detached from patients' pain and suffering. How do you balance those two things on a day-to-day -day basis? Generally, we're pretty good at it, but there's always one patient, isn't there? The one that reminds you of your granny or the one that reminds you of your kid or, or whatever, you know. So these, these are hard things to balance. You know, we, we, we think we manage it, but, you know, it's not hard to get that out of kilter. And then, um, I'm sure most of you have had doctors as patients yourselves. Um, anyone have any stories about the challenges of having doctors as patients? Anyone able to share? Are we, are we good patients? Are we easy patients? Are we difficult? Anyone, anyone able to share? No. Nobody? Okay. Somebody? Oh, go on, please. Yeah. Oh, whole mixture. Let's have two people. Go on, whole mixture. Yeah. Can be tricky, absolutely, absolutely. And thank you. Yeah, yeah. In, indeed, and, and well meant, but exactly, exactly, yeah, absolutely. So just read this next slide, and then slowly, and then, and then read it again. said read it again, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, do we treat, how do we treat doctors as patients? How do we want to be treated as patients? And when people come and see me, I say, well, listen, I'm going to treat you exactly like I would any other patient, but I'm going to treat you like a doctor as well. And it's getting that balance right that, that is important and, you know, hugely important to say, right, you know, you're not just going to come here and tell me what you think needs to be done. We're going to sit down, we're going to introduce ourselves, we're going to take a proper full history, and then we're going to, we're going to, we're going to go through this properly. This is, this is important. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about doctors' health and well-being here um, at the OUH. Um, I, this is just a graph of how many doctors we've seen, new consultations that we've seen in our department over the last few years. I mean, the red is consultants, the green is junior doctors. I haven't, I've just done the statistics for this year, it's gone up again. This year we saw 57 consultants and 136 junior doctors. Uh, that's, that's about more than probably 10% of the actual uh, doctor population of the hospital, and we saw about another 40 or 50 um, for the deanery as well on top of that. Uh, I mean, around here, I started doing doctor's induction and talking every month of doctor's induction, and I think um, as we started seeing more and more particularly junior doctors coming through, I set up a program, which I've been doing for quite a few years now, trying to educate doctors and support doctors and tell them what, what, what's out there. So first of all, I do talk at doctor's induction every month. I have 20 minutes, and we really, it's an introduction to occupation health, the important things that I think are relevant to doctors, but including how they can come and get help and support um, for psychological and physical problems. I talk to all the FY1s, I have an, an hour with all the FY1s, and that's very much self-care for new doctors, how do you look after yourself when you just start medicine. Um, I do a session with all the FY2s, which is more about practical tools to be resilient, how can we improve our resilience. And I do lectures like this to um, consultants, and I do, I do workshops. If anybody wants me to come and, and run a workshop for, for a group of consultants, I'm, I'm very happy to, to do that. And I've, we've called it the What's Up, What's Up dot program. Um, what is resilience? I mean, there's a lot of talk about resilience and resilience training. You know, what is it and can we, can we improve people's resilience? Well, resilience is really the ability to bounce back from, from adversity. Um, and some people do have a, a, a stronger, I think, natural resilience than, than others. There's some work to suggest that those of us with higher emotional intelligence may be a bit more resilient. I mean, there's four key personality traits that help people to be more resilient. I mean, one is uh, just personal confidence. 
Uh, two is social support, hugely important that you're not just sort of going home to a, a room on your own, that you've got family and friends around you for support when things get tricky. The third thing is having a sense of purpose, and I would say that that's one of the positive things that we all have in the NHS. You know, we, we all know what we're here for, hopefully. You know, we're here to hopefully make people better and look after people, so I think that's important. And the last and probably most important is the ability to be adaptable to, such, to change, because change is going to keep on happening, and those of us that can adapt better to change probably, probably cope better. And the question is, can we actually build resilience? Is there anything we can do to make ourselves stronger? Well, I think understanding our own personalities is important. I actually, um, I am a, I'm a Myers-Briggs trainer, and I, I strongly believe in, in, in looking at people's Myers-Briggs um, type indicator personality tests. Too many times we do these MBTI um, assessments at a conference or at a seminar, and then you put them in the drawer and you don't look at them again. So I suggest if you've ever done it, get it out and actually have a look, because it can be a really helpful tool in understanding yourself better and understanding how you relate to other people. I think making sure we're in the right specialty that suits our personalities. I mean, you know, I guess you, you know, when, I, when I talk to sort of younger doctors, it's not uncommon that I'll come across a psychiatrist that doesn't like talking to patients and is very stressed. You know, seriously, you've, you've got to be in the, in the specialty that suits you. It takes a while to find it. Um, and um, I talk to people quite a lot about how to modify negative thoughts and, and, and so on, but we haven't got time for that today. The thing I do want to talk a little bit about today is how we can look after our own health and well-being a little bit better. And just a couple of, of stress-busting tips as well. So first of all, this is a guide. This is the guide that we, we give all our FY1s when they start. Um, about um, It's the Royal College of Physicians guide about how to do night shifts. Nobody, amazingly, I find, is taught about how to do night shifts properly. In uh, you know, there are tips about how to you know how to prepare, how to recover afterwards. Um, nobody seems to ever teach that in medical schools. So that's just a, a small but useful thing. Um, this one's an in, important one, and I'm going to ask you the question that I, I ask all the junior doctors as well. So listen very carefully. I want you to put up your hand if you haven't put off going to the toilet in the last month at work when you really needed to go um, because you were so busy. So put up your hand if you haven't put off going to the toilet. So I have. I have one person in the room. Well done, congratulations. That's very impressive. Now, you know, I think this is really, really important. You know, if we don't look after our own basic bodily needs, how do we look after the patients in that care? It's a bit like talking to toddlers, isn't it? Now, when you need to go to the toilet, you go to the toilet. I mean, this is huge as far as I'm concerned. This is, this is bottom line. This is, this is basic. You know, we can't all have toilets at our desk. It's, it's vital. Um, food. There's, there's a lot of research now about diet and health and mental health and, I, and that's something I feel very I'm very interested in and I feel I feel very strongly about um, and um, you know making sure that we do eat properly even though that we're very busy is incredibly important we've done a bit of work with a few wards where we, we they, they've actually done a, a trial where they've had a huge fruit bowl on the ward and they've actually asked patients to bring in fruit instead of chocolates and biscuits and so on and that fruit bowl is actually for everybody it's just a just something to think about um, Exercise, yes, exercise, yeah. Um, uh, it, easier, easier said than done. I know we're all very busy. I know it's very difficult, but you know that's the what you know. There's really good evidence again that exercise can help us to to deal with with stresses in our lives. Having, having time to do something other than medicine, I think, is incredibly important. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be Sudoku, it can be flower arranging, it can be learning French. But I, think, I think that's hugely important. Uh, we talked about the importance of, of registering with a GP, and that's actually manor surgery, which is the GP surgery at the back of the hospital site, and they're very happy to have junior doctors who are only here for six months registering. Uh, learning relaxation techniques. I mean, I do teach the juniors. Uh, this is just a breathing exercise that I teach them, and, and we do run some mindfulness sessions for staff as well. Um, I think this is probably, if there was one, one take-home message from this whole lecture today, it's this one, nurturing the important relationships in your life. The people that I see who really get into trouble are the ones that stop doing this. It doesn't matter whether it's your partner, your parents, your, your children, but if you stop, you're so busy and you work so hard that you stop looking after these relationships, things go wrong. Surgeons have got the highest divorce rate of all doctors. Actually, doctors don't have that high a divorce rate overall. It's about 24, 25%. You folks have a 33% divorce rate, so just, just bear that in mind. Uh, sharing your stories when things go wrong, not, not taking things home and making sure you talk to colleagues and friends about it. 
be wearing, be wearing that glass of wine in the evening if you've had a hard day and, and making sure that, you know, that glass of wine just doesn't get bigger every day. Um, and laughing a bit more often. I think, I think laughing is incredibly important. They say that uh, children laugh 500 times a day and adults only laugh, laugh maybe 10 to 15 times a day. This is, this is a s picture that made me laugh that one of my patients sent me, so hopefully you'll like it too. So that's... Uh... So uh, just where are their sources of help? Well, obviously, you can self-refer to occupational health. There is an employee assistance program with counselling for everybody in the whole trust. There's information on that on the front of the internet page. There's something called Medic Support, which is the counselling service for the deanery that any junior doctor can refer to. And there's also, of course, the, the professional support unit of the deanery as well. And that's just the, the little brochure that we hand out to all new doctors in the trust. So I just want to finish by talking just a little bit, just maybe five more minutes if that's okay, on how you do refer either yourself or a junior to occupational health if you have concerns about people. I mean, certainly, you know, if you do have health problems that you think are impacting on your work, please, please come and see us. Very important to think about medication side effects. Has anybody uh, actually, I'm just asking the last of a month or two, has anybody prescribed gabapentin for a patient of working age here? It's not so much, a, yeah, somebody, yeah. I mean, do you ask what job they, you know, the important thing is things like gabapentin uh, really affects y your cognition and how you function. And, and, you know, people often prescribe these things without thinking, you know, if you do that next time, think about what job they're doing and how they're going to manage at work. It's a very good pain relief medication, but you need to think about it, how that affects you. Obviously, if you've got an alcohol or drug problem, we're, we're very happy to see you and, and support you and find some help for you. And the trust is very clear, because I wrote, policy, so I can tell you that I know the trust is very clear, that the first time this happens, it's looked upon, you know, if you, if you say you've got a drug or alcohol problem, it's very much looked upon as a health issue. If you then get help and treatment and you have a recurrence, that, that's a different matter, but it's, it is very much looked upon as a health issue. And again, stress, fatigue, or if you think you might be infected with the blood borne virus and so on. And just to remind you, good medical practice, GMC, booklet, um, protect patients and colleagues from any risk posed by your health. Just remind you which sections are important. This is section 28. If you know or suspect that you have a serious condition that you could pass on to patients, or if your judgment or performance could be affected by a condition or its treatment, you must consult a suitably qualified colleague. You must follow their advice about any changes to your practice they consider necessary. You must not rely on your own assessment of the risk to patients. Section 29 is you should be immunized against chemical diseases, and you should be registered with your GP. So, if you have a trainee that you're concerned about, you know, who, would you, who should you think about referring up? Well, certainly it's important to think about all trainees with performance or behavior issues at, at level two and above. Um, and certainly, I mean, I can think of, uh, again, I'll just give an example of a G GP trainee who was referred to see me who'd failed their exams five times. They're only allowed to do the exams six times. And after the fifth time, they thought, is it worth asking if there's a health problem? There was a very serious health problem that was, that was affecting them. You know, you need to think about that much earlier than that. Um, uh, you know, obviously, if, if there's long-term sickness absence now, because doctors don't go off sick, it really is worth referring people up early. And again, if, they, if there's recurrent short-term sickness absence, the trust policy says if there's three absences in six months. But again, just, just think about it with junior doctors, particularly if they're missing on call, what's, what's going on here? Is, is it worth having a chat about, about a possible referral? Um, as I said before, we also see um, referrals for the deanery, particularly when they don't have access to their own occupational health services or if there's particular training problems too, so we, we often do that. And how do you refer? Well, it's very important that you discuss the referral with the junior doctor. You remind them that we're independent and confidential. You fill in a referral or write a referral letter. And our, our referral is actually on our website. We've actually got a tick box referral form to make things easier for you. Please, please give us relevant background information because otherwise we don't know the other side of the story. Make sure that they get a copy of the letter as well. There's no point. So, you know, occasionally in the past, you know, I've got a referral, dear Evie, please do see this consultant. We're, we're worried that they're drinking too much alcohol, but we haven't discussed it with them. You know, I can't really deal with that. You know, you've got to, do, you've got to have that conversation first and say, listen, you know, why, why do we think we've got concerns, you know, and, and, but, and I think we're going to refer you up. And again, these are the sort of things that you might be asking in a referral. You know, is Dr. A fit for their current role? If not, you know, how long might they be off sick for? 
Could their medical problems be contributing to behaviour or performance issues at work? Are there any workplace factors we need to think about? Could they be considered disabled under something called the Equality Act 2010? Do you all, do you all know about the Equality Act? Does, no, people are saying no, okay. So the Equality Act used to be called, well, was really the Disability Discrimination Act became the Equality Act. And um, really, if somebody has a medical condition which affects their day-to-day -day activities and is either, has either lasted for more than 12 months or is likely to last in 12 months, they come under the Equality Act. And you can also take off the positive effects of any, any medication from that. Um, then their employer or training organisation is asked to look at reasonable adjustments. That might mean reducing hours, it might be changing duties, it might be, might be a whole load of issues. It doesn't mean that the organisation can accommodate those things, but they need to think about them and try and accommodate them. So again, what happens in an occupational health assessment? Well, very similar to any other assessment. Ideally, particularly if we see consultants, we try and get one of our consultants to see consultants, but we have some fabulous nurses in our department, very, very capable nurses as well. Um, we take a full history, we might examine you if it's relevant. With consent, we'll get medic background medical information from you, we'll assess your fitness to work, we'll give you advice about rehabilitation, we might refer you for physio, we might refer you for counselling, we consider adjustments that help you get back to work, and we will probably see you again. Um, and when I'm thinking about getting people back to work, I mean, really, I'm thinking about three main things, actually. You know, are, they, are you well enough for you to get back to work? And is work going to... Sorry, I don't know what the matter with this is. It's sitting on. Um, are you well enough for you? Are you well enough for patients in your care? And are you, are you well enough that you're not going to upset your... You know, have an adverse effect on your colleagues as well? But also, are you well enough to do the job that, that you're being paid to do? And that's, that's important as well. And just to say that the Occupational Health Report, um, you can ask to see your report before it's sent out um, under GMC um, uh, le legislation called confidentiality, confidentiality legislation. Um, and that report would normally be sent back to your manager, whoever that is, copied to you, sometimes copied to other people as well. And the challenge with young junior doctors is, you, you know, you can end up needing to copy it to too many people. Clinical supervisors, educational supervisors, sometimes the TPD, sometimes medical staffing, sometimes their PSU coach, and it can make them feel that, you know, you want to try and not copy too many people in, if at all possible. Just to say, in very complex cases, we organise case conferences in our department, and we, um, um, and so we just get everyone round the, the table and have discussion and try and sort out problems to, together. Um, just to say, there's some very good books about doctor's health. Uh, this is the one I really like. It's called Iron Doc by a Canadian psychiatrist called Manta Gautam. It's very, very short. You can often get it secondhand on Amazon. Uh, Practical Stress Management for Physicians. This is the British equivalent. It's much longer and drier, I have to say. And uh, just to finish, the Royal Medical Benevolent Fund has also just come out with a, a really very good guide for doctors seek, seeking help and advice. And I'm just going to leave you to read this advert as my last, last slide, really. Uh, wanted medical staff, I'll just leave you to read that. So, if after that you want to talk to me, <laughs> that's how you get hold of me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>